Sports. Hello, Mike here, and in this video, I'm going to talk to you about geospatial machine learning. Talking about spatial and location, I'm recording this video in Australia on the land of the Yagara and the Turrbal people. Now, I'd just like you for just one moment to think about all of the different data sets that you've got, maybe at your work or at home or wherever it is that you're watching this video, and think about how many of them actually have location data built into them. It might be a little bit more than you initially think, because it's not just GPS coordinates and maps that have location and geospatial data in them. It's also things like photographs. So if you're taking a photograph with a smartphone or any modern camera, then it's going to put GPS coordinates into the metadata of that picture so you know where it was taken. Think about your customer lists. Those customers have names, maybe preferences for those customers, but they also might have addresses of those customers too. Those addresses are, of course, location information. It's all different types of geospatial information. Now, let's look at geospatial from a technical point of view for just a moment. There are two different types of geospatial information. There's raster information. These essentially are images. So if you think of a photograph that's been taken of the surface of the Earth, then that's a raster geospatial image, if, as long as it's got metadata in there to explain whereabouts it is on the surface of the planet. Now, it doesn't have to just be visible light, so a photograph of the planet's surface. We could use all kinds of different types of uh, electromagnetic radiation coming off the surface, um, uh, infrared radiation, so that we can read all kinds of things about the surface. But at the end of the day, when you and I look at it, it looks like an image. That's raster-based geospatial information. As well as that, we've got the vector-based geospatial information. This is like points of interest. So where is a particular thing? So where is a location of your store or your customer? Or where is the location of a disaster, for example? Um, but also not just those points, but lines as well. So where are the roads that exist in our geospatial data set? So if you think about it, it's very much aligned with the kinds of data that we'd have in graphics and graphics design. So images and vectors. But in both cases, they've got geospatial coordinates and data built into those data sets. So those are the two different kinds of data that we talk about. Now, what can we use machine learning and geospatial data to unlock? Well, I've got some great examples here on this slide. So we can use it to assess risk and insurance claims. So if we're looking at where there's been, say, for example, a natural disaster, we can understand what the impact of the risk on our business is going to be, for example, when we understand where that disaster is and which customers we have which live in the particular area. We can use it to monitor climate change. So let's look at those ice caps. Let's measure those ice caps and how they're changing over time. Let's look at areas of the world which might flood and look at those floods in a historical sense as they change. And we can use it to predict retail demand. So what about if we've got a whole new uh, communities being built and we can see that there's demand for our product in a certain area, but we've got no store there. Well, machine learning can help to predict whereabouts we might want to place that retail store. So lots of different use cases here. And of course, there are way more use cases beyond just that. So here I've got a sort of timeline of a geospatial machine learning project. And we start off with getting access to geospatial data sources. Now, they may be data sources that you have. So they may be customer lists with those addresses in that we were talking about before. But they could also be that raster information, say, for example, mapping of the planet's surface. So imagery of the planet's surface. Maybe you want to do some analysis of different land use. Where do you get those images from? Now, these data sets are usually enormous. So negotiating to actually get them, even if they're open source, and then working with all the technical twos and fro's to actually get that into your machine learning pipeline is expensive, and it's complex, and it takes time. Now, after we've got those data sets in, and we've managed to wrangle them into some platform that we can work on them, we then have to transform and enrich that data. And there are some standard 
run-of-the-mill kinds of jobs that we have to do, such as cloud removal. And there are some standard jobs, such as going through all of those customers and turning those addresses into geospatial locations. All of this takes time. And all of this is a lot of heavy lifting that isn't undifferentiated. This doesn't make you different from any of your competitors. So it's just heavy lifting work. Then we have to select and train our model, and we might have to develop our own models. There might be models that exist already, and then we have to get some infrastructure to actually empower those models to go and work on our data. Once we've done that and once we've deployed our model, then we have to visualize. This is the interaction with humans. How do we actually show the results to someone, whether that's someone who's familiar with geospatial data or not? Can we display it on a map so that we can show someone the relationship between two different points in geospatial space? So how can we help? Well, at reInvent 2022, the SageMaker team announced support for geospatial inside of SageMaker in AWS. And SageMaker geospatial capabilities support each of these steps that we've just looked at in the overall uh, project scope of a geospatial project. Let's take a look at each one of those in a little bit more detail. So first of all, access to geospatial data. So I talked before about how geospatial data sets can be enormous. And it might be that you've got your own, or it might be that you rely on open source data sets. Copying all of that data in somewhere is time consuming. But now it's built in to Amazon SageMaker with the geospatial capabilities. We've got access to Landsat 8 and Sentinel-2 data sets right there, an API call away. But you can also bring in your own data sets. Of course, the best place to store vast quantities of data is S3. So if you put your geospatial raster imagery inside of S3, then you can get access to that through SageMaker as well. And then you can make those data sets available to everybody in your organization. So once you've brought them in, once you've done the negotiation or you've bought the data sets in, or you've decided which parts of the open source data set that you want to focus on, you can have those then registered in SageMaker so that other members of the organization can get access to them. And if you do any processing of that data, they can get access to that process data so that you don't have to keep reinventing the wheel every time you start a new project. Now let's talk about transforming and enriching your data. This is where the machine learning really comes into play. And we can use what's called an Earth observation job inside of SageMaker to process the massive amounts of raster information that we might have downloaded from our open source data sets or from the provider that we're using. And then we can also enrich our data, for example, our customer database with all of those addresses. We can push that into a processing job, which will enrich it with the vector information, the actual points of interest, the GPS location of each of those addresses. And we're not talking about just putting 10 addresses in. We're talking about putting thousands or tens of thousands of addresses. It works at scale. So once we've transformed and enriched our data, we're then on to selecting and training our model. Now, there are models built into SageMaker geospatial capabilities. They're state of the art, they're pre-trained, and they're ready to go for things like cloud removal, for segmentation and land use segmentation. So you can see what's happening inside of those raster imagery. You can also, of course, create your own models and bring them in and run those at scale using SageMaker as well. And once you've done that, what about the visualization side? How do we show people what we've done? Well, now inside of SageMaker, you've actually got the ability to be able to visualize your geospatial data of both kinds with multiple layers to interact with it, to filter it out, and to tell the story of the geospatial project that you're working on. And I really want to show you what this looks like. So let's jump into the AWS console and go to SageMaker Studio. And here inside of SageMaker Studio, if I go over to the menu on the left hand side, I can select Geospatial and it'll show us the new landing page for the geospatial capabilities. If I just scroll down here, you can see all of the different features. Let's choose Earth Observation Jobs. This is where we get to process raster information. So I can go ahead and click on Create Job. It'll ask me to name the job and then what kind of task I want to do. What model do I want to choose from the pre-designed models? So I'm going to choose cloud masking to remove some uh, clouds from some raster imagery. 
I then have to tell it my area of interest. So I'm going to upload a GeoJSON file which has got a area of interest defined here on the south of England um, and that shows me in the map where I'm currently looking. I can change the amount of cloud coverage that I'm willing to accept and I can also choose the different um, image collections that I might want to use. Once I've got that set and once I'm happy with the settings here I can scroll down and click on create and that's all there is to it. The Earth observation job will now go off, grab that data from the repository and start to process it with the model we just selected, just from a few clicks. Now, if we go into vector enrichment jobs, this shows us the status of the vector enrichment jobs, such as, for example, changing our customer addresses into points of interest. And then here on this last tab, we've got map visualizations. So this is where we get to demo and show and explain and tell the story of our geospatial data. Let me just upload a data set quickly from my machine. And here you can see uh, around about 34,000 data points that have been mapped over the surface of Australia. And look at how quickly that loaded and look at how quickly I can navigate around those points. If I just go to the menu here on the left hand side, there are some options. I can change what those data points look like and I can even select a 3D model. Now if I just scroll in so we can see the 3D model that I just selected and if I get in far enough you can just about see, yeah, these are squeaky bath toy ducks. So I'm not really sure that that's necessarily going to be useful, but it's just a demo and you can upload your own images as you like. Just make them a little bit bigger there and scroll out. What I'm showing you here is the power of the 3D rendering of this 3D map now that it is of all of these data points over the surface of the planet. But it's not just in SageMaker Studio. We can also work with geospatial data inside of notebooks, of course. If we look at the newly available data images, we've now got Geospatial 1.0, which is an image we can use for our notebooks, which contains all of the up-to-date libraries. I'm not gonna click that right now. What I'm gonna do is go over to my files where I have recently synced uh, the Amazon SageMaker examples GitHub repository, and I'll show you a link to that in just a moment. And inside there, we've actually got some demo notebooks that the SageMaker Geospatial team has put together for us. Now, I'm not going to go through these in a lot of detail right now. I'll leave it for you to go through them in your own time. I just want to show you some of the core capability that the SDK has. So if we just start to run some of these cells, we can load the necessary libraries. Um, and here you can see that we can actually select the area of interest we want and start off an Earth observation job using the SDK. So just in the same way as we could in the console, but here just with a little bit more control and repeatability. I'm going to accelerate this video just a little bit because the Earth observation jobs do take a little bit of time to process all of that data. But the reason why I wanted to show you that here right now is because I wanted to show you how you can visualize the data actually inside of the notebook itself. So if we just do this map render here, you'll notice that we actually get the viewer, the map viewer, inbuilt to our notebook environment. We can then start to add layers to it. So here I'm adding the area of interest on top of our map and then we can add the input layer. So this is the input to our machine learning. So it's going to, it's going to show us the rasterized base layer, if you like, um, of this particular area of the world, this, uh, this lake. And then we can overlay on top of that the output layer. So what was the output of the machine learning that we just did? And we can see here this is some land segmentation and it's identified the areas of the map which are water. And if you step through this notebook more, you'll see how it makes use out of this to map the change in surface area of this particular lake. And that's just a quick view of the new geospatial capabilities inside of SageMaker, both inside of SageMaker Studio and inside of the actual notebooks themselves as well. If you wanted to take a look at those notebooks that I was talking about there, you can get them from here. So this is github.com um, forward slash AWS Amazon SageMaker examples. And if you want to know more about the geospatial capabilities inside of SageMaker, then there are more sessions coming up on March the 24th. We've got a 15 minute webinar demo. And on March the 31st, we've got a 16 minute deep dive into the technology, which we've just brushed the surface of today. Look out for the registration pages on those going live in February.
Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to have a look at geospatial machine learning inside of SageMaker. I'm Mike Chambers, and I'll see you next time.